Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dave Lubnick with YCharts, and I'm excited to welcome Laura Krieger with Vetify. And we're going to walk you through uh, the first quarter fund flows in review. Um, as you might be familiar with from prior YCharts webinars, uh, there will be a Q&A chat feature. If you'd like to submit any questions along the way, we'll try to get to those either during the webinar or at the end. Um, and from a housekeeping perspective, please keep in mind that the content of this webinar is meant for educational purposes only and is not intended to be used as investment advice, nor is YCharts acting as an advising party regarding client funds in any way. I'd also like to point out that a recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone tomorrow and will also be available as a replay on our YouTube channel. So please remember to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future videos as well. So with that, Thank you again for joining. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Dave. I'm the SVP of Institutional Sales with YCharts, where we focus um, on my team exclusively on distribution teams. We're excited to work with over 2,200 wholesalers who leverage the tool dynamically for their conversations with advisors. Um, and a lot of what they're talking about is ETFs. So excited to welcome Laura here to walk us through what we saw in the first quarter. Thank you so much for that intro, Dave. Uh, as Dave said, I'm the editor-in-chief of Vetify. I manage a team um, behind the three award-winning online publications, ETF Trends, ETF Database, and Advisor Perspectives, where we are providing news and analysis about the trends that are impacting financial advisors, uh, about the ETF markets as well. So I'm so happy to be here today, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to kind of rolling up the sleeves and diving into the data with you, Dave. Absolutely. Yeah, we got some great content to get through. To set the stage here, um, I'd say probably three main topics that we're going to be hitting on here. First off, thankfully, cue the music. We finally saw uh, a wonderful month of outflows from money market mutual funds in March, uh, a, a big contrast to what we'd seen in January and February. We'll dig into that. Um, as it relates to ETFs, we're going to dissect um, what we're seeing from a flow perspective as well as performance, comparing passive versus active versus smart beta. And then we're going to dig into, of course, Bitcoin ETFs, which have received quite a bit of attention in the first quarter here. So, Laura, why don't you take us away? Okay, thank you so much for that. So, we have some real showstopper charts in today's deck. This one's the first. So, take a look at the left-hand chart. In March 2024, we saw about $92 billion coming out of money market funds. This is just astonishing, considering how much money we've seen going into these vehicles for the past 12 months. Um, same time, we saw about uh, $49 billion going into fixed income, around $40 billion going into equity funds. So what this is telling me is clearly investors are taking their cash off the sidelines and starting to put it to work in the markets. And the story continues when we, we kind of zoom out to that full quarter. So on the chart on the right-hand side here, we see that investors are Locking to fixed income ETFs and mutual funds in Q1. Uh, they poured almost $152 billion into this asset class. That's both mutual funds and ETFs. About $100 billion went into mutual funds, about $50 billion into ETFs. It, fixed income is just so hot with investors right now. And what that's saying is that the vehicle of access matters less to them than the still very attractive yields that they can find in this asset class. And on the other hand, Another $54 billion went into equity funds last quarter. And this is interesting because our chart here sort of obscures that there's a very vehicle specific story that's happening here. So equity mutual funds saw about 84 billion in outflows last quarter, while ETFs saw about 138 billion in inflows. And that's how you kind of get to that 54 billion number. And there's all sorts of reasons for investors' preference for ETFs here, but cost and taxes are two of the big ones. Um, ETFs, generally speaking, have lower expense ratios, higher tax efficiency than you know, comparable mutual funds. So if you're looking at the market thinking, oh, I've got all this cash that I want to put to work and I want to do it in a very cost-effective way, then the chances are you're probably going to opt to participate using the lower cost vehicle versus you know the mutual fund but that 
doesn't necessarily explain the mutual fund outflows, right? And then what's going on here is that we're also seeing some tax loss harvesting in motion, right? So an equity mutual fund declines in value, you sell that mutual fund, harvest the loss for your taxes, then you buy back a new equity exposure, but you'll use an ETF vehicle for those reasons I, I just mentioned a second ago. So like I said, real showstopper chart to kind of open up the presentation. Uh, and we're going to dive more into ETF flows on the next slide. So we want to move. Yeah, thank you. Um, so here we're looking at broad categories of ETF flows in Q1. Like I said, about $138 billion went into equity ETFs last quarter. Um, and a lot of that as we're going to see later on, went into broad U.S. equity funds, kind of that total market exposure, uh, total market exposures. A good chunk of it went into growth funds, um, particularly because of the Max 7 and desire to get access to that growthy tech slice in the market. But in Q1, we also saw the debut of the first spot Bitcoin ETFs, like Dave mentioned just a second ago. And these ETFs, which are falling into that alternatives bucket there, they took in record flows during their first months of life. Um, the iShares one, iBit, took in $14 billion alone in the first quarter. The Fidelity one, FBTC, that took in about $7 billion. So clearly a lot of pent-up demand for this exposure. And we're seeing now, as the, the 13F filings are trickling in, that a lot of that pent up demand came from financial advisors who were allocating, you know, 5 million here or 10 million here for their clients. So um, that said, the, the reason the total inflow in, in this alts bucket isn't higher is because the flows are somewhat balanced out by outflows from a different Bitcoin ETF, which was GPTC, um, converted from a trust structure to an ETF in January. And this fund, Though it launched at the same time as all the other Bitcoin ETFs, it has just been bleeding assets because it's so much more expensive than all the other products on the market. It's got an expense ratio of 150 basis points compared to like 30 for the others. So that's why we're seeing kind of a muted um, alts bucket on this chart. If we go to slide six, though, we can see the scale of what really occurred in Q1. This, I think I love this chart here. Um, so here we have the total assets as of the end of Q1 for gold, silver, and Bitcoin ETFs. Now, look, gold ETFs, they've been around since 2004, and when that was when GLD debuted on the market. Two decades later, they have just over $100 billion in assets under management. Kind of goes higher, kind of goes lower sometimes, but it's, it's a steady state, right? Compare that to Bitcoin ETFs, which have been around for three months, and they already have more than half the assets under management that gold ETFs do. That's how much demand there is for Bitcoin exposure in the market right now. We're not seeing it slow down either. So I think this is going to continue to be one of the big stories of uh, 2024. So um, I think we can, yeah, thanks. Let's move on to the next slide. So here's another one of these really great blockbuster visuals. Lots of hay has been made about active ETFs this year. I saw a stat the other day that said, Upwards of 70% of all ETFs launched in 2024 have been actively managed products. So lots of new takers flooding the market right now. The question is, is this really something investors want, right? You know, it's definitely something issuers want, but is is are investors kind of gravitating to them? I think when you look at this table, you can see that the answer is a resounding yes, right? So you look at this, active ETFs still represent just 7%, less than 7% of total ETF market assets, sliver of the total money invested in ETFs. But they've taken in nearly 30% of the total new money that's gone into ETFs in 2024. So um, some of this is conversions, right? People in mutual funds that are getting converted to ETF and uh, ETF format. And, and a lot of it is due to active ETFs being implemented in model portfolios, which is something we'll get into later. But Reality is that active management is attracting a good chunk of money that's coming off the sidelines right now. And so the conversation is shifting from active versus passive to active and passive, each with its right uh, fit or connotations. And so one of those connotations is fixed income and active management has a long history in the fixed income markets. 
because, you know, the bond market's very opaque and it's difficult for individual investors like you and me to go and access and get good pricing and so on. So that leaves a lot of room for skilled active managers to come in and do one better than that passive total market indexed approach. So we can dive into fixed income. Yeah, thank you uh, on this slide. And this is, uh, I love I love this chart so much because the story here is so consistent between what happened in March and what's happening for the rest of the quarter, right? So in 2024, the story in fixed income has been a pivot away from the shortest end of the curve towards intermediate term exposure. So investors are less afraid of interest rate risk than maybe they were last year. There's a sense that the Fed may reduce rates, but we're certainly not going to see six to eight rate cuts like we're being projected just even a few months ago. If folks are more willing to wait out farther into the duration and, and kind of get those higher yields as a result. So what we see, intermediate term core pond and core plus bond funds taking in about $24 billion together in March and about $70 billion in Q1 overall. Uh, intermediate term government bond funds, they took in $5 billion in March, uh, that's on the left chart, $15 billion overall in Q1, which is on the, sec uh, the right-hand chart. Investors don't want to go too far out on the curve here, but they are willing to take on more risk and peel off some of that short treasury exposure, which we're seeing in the lavender bar on the far right of each chart, uh, the one that's showing the outflows. So if we go to the next slide, we can see that the story remains the same if we drill down just into the fixed income ETFs. So the one big difference here is that ETF investors are still putting more money into treasuries, specifically treasuries, than they are into those broad core exposures. But the microcosm here is very much um, what we're seeing reflected in those total market views on the previous slide in that intermediate is the name of the game. So Let's dive into uh, the intermediate ETF, seeing the most action in the next slide. But I think um, I want to see, okay, we've got a good question here um, first about what we think is driving the inflows into high yield. And I think it's, you ask me, it's probably right there in the name. It's high yield. People, you know, really want that yield, um, you know, after years and years of not being able to get that uh, monthly income coming from um, their fixed income exposures and having to go elsewhere to source it. Finally, high yield can provide that again. But Dave, what do you think? Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. You're seeing the outflows with the short, the short duration, the short government. I mean, anything on the shorter end is either seeing outflows or minimal inflows. Um, anything that has the yield is, is is looking pretty positive across these last few charts. Yeah, it's yield, yield is the name of the game here. So um, let's let's go into this chart here, this, uh, this table. I, this is just such a beautiful table because there's 10 ETFs on it. And at least as many uh, stories embedded in this table. So I'm just going to peel out a couple of the highlights here. First, VGIT, that one right up at the top, the Vanguard Fund, is really tipping the scale here on the quarterly basis. About $4.7 is going into VGIT over the past quarter. The next closest is that iShares Fund, GOVT, which has taken in $3.1 billion. And then you have everything else, which is sub $1 billion in net new assets. So a couple of things out of this. First, both of these ETFs are giving you treasuries exposure. You have that safe, reliable treasuries government exposure. But VGIT is purely intermediate term, while GOVT is giving you exposure to the full yield curve, um, the long end of the curve and the short end of the curve and everything in between. But most importantly, they're both very cheap funds. <laughs> VGIT is only four basis points uh, in expense ratio. GOVT is five basis points. These are among the cheapest and most liquid exposures of their kind. So if you're running a model portfolio and you want to up your portfolio's exposure to intermediate treasuries, well, VGIT is naturally going to be a, a top choice for you. Um, meanwhile, if you want to allocate more to broad treasuries exposure, do you still kind of want to target a duration that falls in line with the intermediate fund? There is GOVT right there, which has a duration of about 
5.9 uh, years right now. So, and it costs five basis points. So it's no wonder that these two funds are such darlings of the model portfolio set. One other um, really quick highlight to point out here, look how popular mortgage-backed securities ETFs are. Four of the top 10 intermediate term bond funds here are MBS funds. One of those funds, the Simplified MBS fund, has seen relatively modest inflows this quarter compared to, you know, a VGIT, but it's still representative of more than half of its total AUM year to date. To me, that just screams model inclusion, um, which I know Simplify has worked on very hard as a firm to, to, to do. So some really cool stories at work here, um, but I want to kind of step back to equities for a moment. So if we can go to the next, thank you. Great blockbuster chart here. I, I just love these. These charts tell the story for me. So look at that. Huge flows, relatively speaking, into large blend equity mutual funds and ETFs last quarter. And we see that being true in March with about 30 billion in inflows and over the entire quarter where we saw about 49 billion in inflows into large blend funds. So kind of an acceleration happening um, of the broader trend. And what kinds of funds are large blend equity? Let's take a second to, to you know talk about that because we're going to talk more about it in a second. But basically, it's your big, broad U.S. large cap exposures, right? Your S&P 500 funds, your factor funds, your single factor funds, that sort of thing. I see we got a question from the audience here. Any insights into GOVT's March flows that are so much higher? Ooh, good question. Can you go back to the um, to the table on the previous slide for just a second? Um, yeah. So if we look at March versus Q1 here, we're seeing that there seems to be a big acceleration in March into flows into GOVT compared to like quarter wide. Um, and I think my interpretation of that um, probably has a lot to do with rate expectations. Uh, you know, the, the, even look, stepping back to January, there was the sense that there were going to be more um, rate cuts and there was just going to be more, um, maybe some rate uncertainty. Now it seems like the Fed is is moving to a different um, rate cutting uh, plan. And so uh, it, it seems to me like that has shifted uh, the the color of, of how people are, are allocating here. But Dave, what do you um, what do you make of this? Looking at this table, what I found interesting, and you touched on this a little bit in relation to the Simplify MBS, is just how many of these top 10 funds are collecting a large percentage of their total AUM as we sit here today, just in the last quarter. Um, it's really showcasing the fact that you can be a relatively new player or a smaller player in the field and become, become relevant very quickly with, with this impressive AUM growth that we see um, you know, a lot of teens and, and in some cases, 34 and 53 percent growth here just in the first quarter relative to their to their base. That's such a good point. I mean, and, and a lot of these are fairly uh, inexpensive options, too. The, has, I mean, the fee war is such a big deal in the ETF landscape that um, I'm not surprised to see that many of these top flows getters here are the cheaper ones, um, you know, not the the really uh, high price tag uh, options in the market. So it uh, all plays together. Yeah, let's um, go to the next slide, I think, and we can dive a little bit deeper into equity versus mutual funds, because um, like we see, like as we saw before, it isn't all the large blend funds that are seeing inflows. Large blend mutual funds are actually seeing outflows to the tune of about. 4 billion over the course of Q1, about uh, 2 billion just in March alone. But that is overwhelmed by this influx of cash going into large blend ETFs. It was about 22, excuse me, 32 billion in March alone, um, 52 billion over the quarter as a whole. So there's definitely a, a vehicle story here. Um, also worth noting, we're seeing an exodus out of large growth mutual funds which lost about $31 billion in total last quarter. Yet large growth uh, ETFs are still taking in money, about $25 billion. So this is really a story about the preferred vehicles of access. And I think, as I said before, a tax loss harvesting story. Um, when it comes time to put your money to work in the equities markets, ETFs with their 
ease of use and their flexibility and their low cost or tax efficiency, they just continue to be the preferred access point for equities. So let's drill into some of those large blend ETFs seeing the flows last quarter. Look at that. Most of the broad-based ETFs uh, that you would expect are taking in the bulk of the money. So the cheap passive vehicles, right? Your S&P 500 ETFs, uh, VU and IVV, and you've got your total stock market exposure uh, fund and VTI. Totally makes a lot of sense. And then there's DYNF, <laughs> this equity factor rotation ETF from BlackRock. It's just sitting there in the middle of this chart. Having brought in nearly $7 billion in inflows for Q1, um, about half of that in March alone, all these boring passive exposures, and then suddenly a spicy factor rotation strategy. So what the heck is going on here? In late January, uh, BlackRock added DYNF to its model portfolios, and the fund went from about $46 million in assets under management to over $2 billion dollars in a single day. And that is an astonishing amount of money moving, but it helps you understand just how powerful inclusion in or exclusion from model portfolios can be for a fund issuer. You know, um, at last estimates that I saw earlier today, BlackRock, BlackRock had about hundred billion dollars in model portfolio assets. So you can see that even just a tiny change in a lineup can lead to billions of dollars moving around. Um, I also want to point out that there's a real emphasis on quality factor exposures here, um, trying to find those companies with the strong financials and the balance sheets that are set up in the long haul. Qual took it about 2.6 billion last quarter. SPHQ took in just over a billion. So if you're taking a look at all the different types of factors out there, low volatility, momentum, and uh, all those different factors, quality is the one that is um, getting the most interest from investors right now. All right, let's see. We have two We have questions. Um, where can we find allocations to model portfolios? Um, a lot of that information is hidden in uh, 13F filings, uh, you know, SEC documents. Um, I think maybe there might be some... Um, uh, you know, Dave, do, is there some functionality that you can use on Y charts to find that information up? Yeah, there's a uh, it, it's an add on for access to UMAs and SMAs, and in our screening tool, you can actually access those UMAs and and see dig into them, searching by securities themselves or looking at the holdings of those models. So there is functionality in Y charts to to help dig in. Wonderful. We also have another question about um, small caps and how that is being, uh, how advisors are positioning into small caps. And um, this is such a great question because we are seeing, at least on the Vetify platform, a great interest in and around small caps. Um, but uh, I would say small caps plus mid caps exposures, right? Those um, those strategies that have that SMID uh, kind of uh, exposure bucket, um, they seem to be the ones that folks are researching more. You know, there's a lot of conversation now about concentration risk in the markets and, you know, as exciting as the MAG7 exposures are and how, you know, high performing they are, there's a lot of worry that maybe we're all too concentrated into those, those stocks. And so maybe we can balance out our portfolios by allocating more towards the smaller ends of the curve. So a lot of advisors are having these conversations and doing the research, doing their homework um, on these funds. And we're seeing some, some movement into them as well. Um, okay, let's go to, where were we? I think, yeah, we were on the dot chart. So uh, I think this is a cool chart. I really, really like this one. Um, so we've been talking a lot about the vehicle story, ETFs versus mutual funds and different flows there. I like this chart because it shows you that even within a narrow band of ETFs, there is a high variance for how they're being used. So here we're just looking at large blend ETFs in the first quarter. And the two axes are um, you know, how much money of inflows went into that ETF year to date, that's on the X axis. And it's plotted against fund returns year to date on the Y axis. And I just briefly wanna call out those, those three big passive S&P 500 ETFs here. You have VU and IVV on one extreme end of the X axis and SPY on the other, uh, extreme end of the x-axis. And no, they all pretty much have about the same return, right? Which makes sense. They don't track the same index. 
But VU and IVV have brought in much more money year to date, while SPY has lost a lot more money. And the reason for that is because VU and IVV are buying whole vehicles, whereas SPY is the trading vehicle. So SPY is the most liquid ETF in the world. I think it's definitely one of the, if not the most liquid security in the world. It's used as a trading implement far more than it's being used uh, as a place to plunk your cash and grow it long term. And that shows up in the flows month after month, quarter after quarter, year after year. Um, so this is kind of a fee story in the fact that VU and IVV are preferred for buy and hold because they are cheaper uh, than SPY. But it's really a story that speaks to the power and flexibility of ETF tradability um, and market liquidity. Okay, so we can we can go to the next slide because um, here's another really fascinating story in motion happening. We are seeing this big swing towards tech uh, sector funds, largely driven by the returns from and the interest in the so-called Magnificent Seven stocks, um, almost $13 billion going into tech sector funds last quarter, about $4 billion going into March alone, um, into, into tech alone in March, excuse me. Um, meanwhile, we're also seeing a rotation out of uh, defensive sectors like healthcare and utilities. So investors are I mean, I guess they're embracing that cyclical trade, but mostly they're just embracing tech. So we can see that on the next slide where a lot of that money is specifically going into tech ETFs. So I cited 13 billion billion going into tech sector funds last quarter. Nearly 11 billion of it went into ETF vehicles, which makes sense because ETFs are great for sector rotation. They're very flexible. They're very tradable and, and all of that. Let's um, dive more into the tech uh, ETFs that saw um, the most excitement in the next slide. Okay, so a lot of interest you see here going into broad tech sector ETFs, right? There's XLK, the spider, the tech sector, uh, tech sector uh, spider ETF. There's VGT, which is the information technology ETF from Vanguard, there's IYW and so on. Um, but I wanna highlight how hot semiconductors have been, right? So 3 billion last quarter went into Vanex SMH and about uh, 780 million into iShares' SOXX or SOX. This is just illustrative, I think, of how um, clever investors are being right now, right? So what, what do I mean by that? So there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm around artificial intelligence, um, but not necessarily a ton of coherency around how to express that as an investment theme. Um, a lot of the AI related ETFs have attracted the hot money and then lost the hot money and AI powered ETFs never really gained much money in the first place, but semiconductors, now that is a way to express your belief in the growth potential of AI because it doesn't require taking a bet on any individual AI company or AI use case or um, AI industry or so on. Our AI powered future, no matter what it looks like, no matter who the beneficiaries are gonna be, it's gonna require semiconductors. And that's, it's gonna require a lot of them too. So hence, I think that's why the semiconductor trade is so smart because it's investing in that engine of growth for the future rather than trying to make those specific bets or make those specific calls. Okay, so let's um, go to the next slide and talk a little bit, uh, you know, round out this discussion before we get to some questions um, about inflows and outflows. So I know I've talked about a lot of detail. I'm going to try and sum it up. We're seeing lots of money come into large blend ETFs like S&P 500 funds and model portfolio friendly funds as investors are taking their cash off the sidelines and putting it to use in the market. We're also seeing a lot of movement toward tech, large cap growth ETFs, um, largely driven by excitement in MAG7 and around artificial intelligence. Bitcoin ETFs have also brought in a tremendous amount of money in the first few months of life. And fixed income investors are peeling off some of that short-term treasuries exposure that they've uh, preferred for the past year and moving out on the curve a little bit towards intermediate uh, term treasuries. 
Now, as that's happening, we're also seeing some motion out of commodities ETFs, largely driven by a pullback from gold, um, as well as some defensive, uh, some outflows from defensive sector ETFs like utilities. Um, and we're also seeing some outflows from emerging market uh, debt, almost certainly due to, you know, concerns around geopolitical tensions and concerns about Chinese debt markets and so on and so forth. So if I could sum up the top stories of Q1, it would be these. First, investors are looking to participate in the markets now, and they're using ETFs rather than mutual funds largely to make those investments. Two, active management really coming into its own in ETF land. I don't foresee that slowing down at all for the remainder of the year. Three, fixed income means exceptionally attractive for investors, um, particularly as they're making that short-term or they're shifting from short-term uh, exposures and ultra short-term into the intermediate part of the curve. And then finally, Bitcoin ETFs moving billions of dollars right now, but so did more model portfolio constituents as well. So I know I've thrown a lot at y'all. Um, thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to move on some more questions from the audience uh, once we uh, hear from Dave. Yeah, thank you very much, Laura. That was uh, that was very insightful. Appreciate it. Um, while we wait if, to see if there's any additional questions, I have one for you as you think about the um, just kind of the trend of asset managers. Obviously, we see the charts and those are not necessarily uh, new themes in the first quarter here as we break out, for example, the flows across the different um, categories for ETFs versus mutual funds, in particular, the equities. I mean, almost every quarter, it's every ETF style box is up and every mutual fund style box is out. It's just a matter of how much. Um, as you have insights into the different asset managers, I mean, several of them have launched ETFs in the last few years. They've built out their distribution teams with the number of people on those teams. What, what do you foresee going forward? I mean, do you think that we get to a point that virtually every asset manager is launching ETFs? Do you think that some will stick with only mutual funds? What's, what's, your, what's your crystal ball as it relates to that? I love that question. That's a really great question. So I'm hearing more and more uh, from folks. I, I heard this conversation a lot at Exchange, was, which is our um, conference uh, that Vetify puts on just a, a few months back. It's an annual conference. We hear a lot from asset managers and advisors. I have a lot of conversations with asset managers there about vehicle agnostic approaches to investment strategies. So not having a separate mutual fund uh, division or an ETF division, but just you know, an investment strategies division. And um, I think that's interesting because it's less about um, trying to, uh, you know, uh, put, put more resources towards mutual funds and certainly uh, more about uh, just accepting ETFs as part of, of the way they're going to do business going forward. So you asked, Am I foreseeing that we're going to see asset like every asset manager having an ETF? Um, yeah, I think we are, um, because that's kind of where investor preferences lie. Like you said, quarter in and quarter out, month in, month out, we are seeing the clear preference for using ETFs as a way to, to allocate uh, new money or allocate money off the sidelines. That's not going to stop. So, you know, that said, there are still applications for which mutual funds do make sense. So it is, I think, a, it's not an ETF versus mutual fund uh, discussion, um, but a mutual fund and ETF discussion. So going forward, absolutely. I think we're going to see even more asset managers launching these products. And also, if we see the SEC um, give the green light for these proposals that are in the market about offering ETFs as a share class of existing mutual funds, uh, you know, this is something that uh, Vanguard did to great impact for years and years and years. They had a patent, the patent expired. And now I think nine uh, or 10 um, asset managers have filed to do the same thing, to, to use the same structure. If that's approved, whoo, the floodgates are open. And you think we've seen a lot of ETFs come to market up to this point. You ain't seen nothing yet if that comes, if that comes to pass. I see we have a question from the audience here. Oh, 
yeah. How might the introduction of ETF share classes impact flows moving forward? That's exactly the, you know, very prescient. So the answer um, <laughs> good one. Good question. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Hopefully everybody found this insightful. I certainly did. Um, we will be sending out the recording, as we mentioned earlier. Laura, thank you so much for your time and your insights and look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you so much for having me today. This is a real pleasure. Thank you.